Our scripture this morning is uh, the gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Very familiar passage at this time of year. Uh, We're going to stop at a rather discordant spot, but you'll see there's a purpose for that. So the gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. I'm going to give you a pop quiz. Uh, Don't get scared, it's only one question. It's multiple choice, and there really are no wrong answers because the answer depends just on you. Um, There is one stipulation. I'm going to present a situation in which you may find yourself this December. You may well have already found yourself in this situation. And I'm going to give you four options as a way of respond, uh, a, a way of responding. But the stipulation is this. I want you to choose not the way you would actually respond, but the way you would like to respond. Because we all know there's quite often a huge disconnect between what we would really like to do and what we do, or what we would really like to say and what we actually say. There's our Christian upbringing and societal Uh, regulations and all sorts of things that keep us from doing what we'd really like to do. So your stipulation is that you need to pick the answer for what deep down you would really like to do. Okay? You're at Walmart. You are in the 10 items or less line. You've got a lot of stuff going on. Everything's hectic. You notice the person in front of you has 11 items in their cart. And I know I'm not the only person here who counts the number of items in the cart in front of me in the 10 or underline. They also have 11 coupons. They have their checkbook out, but they have not yet started to write. And they do not start to write until the cashier tells them what their total amount is. So that's the situation. Here are your possible responses. And remember, the one you would like to do, not the one you would do. A, stand there calmly, patiently, and wait for the person to be done. B, uh, stand there patiently, wait for the person to be done, but all the while muttering, bah humbug, under your breath. C, reach into the person's cart, take out one item, and ask a stock boy to reshelve it. (laughs) Or D, grab their coupons, rip them into pieces, throw it up in the air and say, look, it's snowing. Now remember the stipulation. What you would like to do, not what you would do. And remember, lying is a sin. And I'm already praying for the first service because I don't think they were honest with me. So who would choose A who, as what you would like to do? Not as what you would do, but as what you would like to do. A, just stand there patiently. Come on, folks. I think the only honest person in the first service was Don. But, um, okay, second, stand there patiently, but grumble under your breath. And again, we're talking what you'd like to do, not what you would do. Uh, C, take an item out of their cart and have it reshelf so they actually have 10 items. All right, finally, some honest people. Uh, D, rip up their coupons and throw them up in the air and say, look, it's snowing. There you go. Now, just to be completely honest with you, we would probably have to do examples all the way to Z to get to what I would really like to do (laughs) in that situation. Um, And if we had more time, we would do more situations. But I think this makes my point. We don't like to wait. We humans are not patient. When I'm in that line, I want to get through and I want to go. When I'm driving and the traffic's bad, I get frustrated. When we're Weight Watchers and the people after they weigh in stand up there and chat, I get frustrated. I want, 
I don't like to wait, and I am not alone in that. We are not patient people. Uh, waiting for us is usually not a good thing. We see it as a bad thing. But the scripture that we read this morning tells us something specifically about waiting for God. And Luke actually paints waiting in a very positive light. Luke says to us through this, this uh, true story that waiting is a good thing. In verse 6, Luke writes, And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. While they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. The three words in the middle of that sentence, the time came, are pregnant with meaning. And I, I don't mean that as a double entendre since Mary was pregnant, but they are just full of theological meaning. Luke does not simply mean while they were there, Mary's contractions started. Those three words, the time came, proclaim one of the greatest theological truths that we can find in Scripture. While they were there, according to God's plan for our salvation, the time came. While they were there, because God decided, the time came. Those words are just full of meaning. While they were there, while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for the birth of the one whose life and death would save us all from sin. There in Bethlehem at that moment, at that exact moment was the right time for the gift worth waiting for, which is Jesus Christ. God's plan was being carried out in God's way, in God's place, and in God's time. And a big part of our life as followers of Jesus Christ is waiting. Waiting for God, waiting for something to happen. We wait for prayers to be answered. In fact, you've heard me not just today, but on numerous mornings during the pastoral prayer, ask God for patience for us to wait as he answers our prayers. We wait for loved ones to come to Christ. We wait for God to reveal himself to us through scripture. We wait for epiphanies those moments when God becomes suddenly more real, more, more tangible, more powerful to us. And as we've already said, especially during Advent, we wait with this eager expectation for that day when, when Jesus Christ is going to come back and take us home. And all the suffering of this life is, is not even going to be a memory. We won't even remember it. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, is my Christian hero. If you've not read any of his works or, or works about him, you need to. While he was imprisoned by the Nazis, he wrote a lot of letters, sermons, and in one of the letters he wrote, everything has its time, and the main thing is that we keep step with God, and do not keep pressing on a few steps ahead, nor keep dwaddling a step behind. Everything has its time. And that is a huge part of our life as Christians. Waiting on God, trying to keep step with him, uh, trusting that he knows best, not, uh, not forging ahead because we believe that, that God is moving too slowly, or not lagging behind because we believe that God is, is moving too quickly. It's a big part of our life, is waiting. However, we have already admitted we are not patient people. We don't like to wait. We like things to go on our schedule. We do not like inconveniences. Waiting frustrates us. And waiting on God can be frustrating because we may not always be aware of God's timing and plan. In fact, I would say more often than not, we are not aware of what God has planned for us in the next moment or in the next day. Um, we may not always understand God's timing and plan. And God forgive us, we may not always approve of God's timing and plan, as if when it comes right down to it, our opinion really matters or, or has any say in the matter. In Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph were the only two people who had any idea at this point that anything special was going on. And their, their knowledge was, was very limited. They did not fully grasp what was happening. Remember, Joseph considered divorcing Mary quietly 
So he completely did not understand uh, what was going on. So they had a limited understanding. And with all the commotion created by the census, a young pregnant peasant woman giving birth in a cave or in a stall uh, would have gone completely unnoticed. Nobody would have looked at that scene and thought there's something special going on here. The most important moment in human and divine history, shy of the cross, went virtually unnoticed. In all of the archaeological studies they've done in Bethlehem, nobody has ever found an innkeeper's ledger with a footnote at the bottom. Had to turn away a young couple today. She was pregnant, so I let him sleep in the back. Something special about them. Nobody's ever found anything like that because nobody knew that anything special was going on. Nobody, except for Mary and Joseph at this point, had even the slightest inkling that God's plan was about to head out in a new and startling direction. And even Mary, who had an insider's view, had reason to be skeptical about God's timing. Her baby was delivered in a cave. His first cradle had probably just been used briefly before to feed an animal. They were away from family and home and the meager uh, comforts and protection that may have provided. And of course, the big issue, she wasn't married and she was pregnant. Uh, in our culture, that has really come to lose meaning. But to understand Mary and Joseph's situation, you need to think of a modern Muslim culture under Sharia law and how they treat unmarried pregnant girls. That's the situation. That is much more like the situation Mary was in than what is comparable in our culture today. This is not exactly every mother's dream for her first child. And yet Luke writes, the time came. As difficult as it might have been for them to understand this was God's way and, and this was God's place and this was God's time. And at the moment of Jesus' birth, there was no trumpet fanfare. There were no fireworks. Uh, there were no comets blazing across the sky. There were no parades. There was no shouting. There was just a man and a woman and a baby and God. That's all there was at that moment. To worldly eyes and worldly minds and worldly hearts, there was nothing special about that moment. God often, and I would say most often, works in our lives in those moments that are very unspecial. God works in our lives at those times when someone would look, looking at us would say, hmm, not much spiritual going on in that person's life. We may ask, what can I do for God? What is God doing for me? My life is so mundane. Certainly nothing spiritual or divine going on here. Well, tell me, what is more mundane than a peasant child being born in a cave and laid in an animal's food trough to sleep? What is more mundane than that? As I stated a few weeks ago, that entire picture points toward poverty and oppression and outsiderness. No one looking at them from the outside would have had any idea that one of the two greatest moments in human history was taking place right there in front of them. The most humdrum moment of your life may be the time for which God has prepared you. In fact, I'm ready to say that the humdrum moments are more likely to be the times for which God has prepared you than the exciting moments. Those moments when you and everyone around you might be tempted to say, certainly nothing special going on there. I believe those are the moments that God is most likely to bless you or to shine through you or to use you to bless other people in his way, on his time, at his place. Those normal, everyday moments may be opportunities for you to show tremendous faith and obedience by playing the part God has laid out for you, but doing it in his way, at his place, and at his time. So if a big part of our lives as Christians is waiting, waiting for God, 
And even if the most unamazing moments of our lives, I know I just made up a word, but even if the most unamazing moments of our life are full of God potential, then we need to learn how to wait effectively. And remember, we're people who don't like to wait. We're impatient. We need to learn to wait effectively. Waiting is not a passive event. Waiting is not just sitting and and twiddling our thumbs. Waiting on God requires patience if we're going to do it effectively. Henry Nouwen was a Catholic priest. He died several years ago. He wrote, waiting is a period of learning. The longer we wait, the more we learn about him for whom we are waiting. The more we learn of God and about God while we're waiting for him, the better prepared we are to begin to live within his timing, his way, his place, his time. So if we want to increase our chances of making the most of those mundane opportunities in which God wants to work, then first our mission becomes recognizing and taking advantage of those special moments that he gives us, realizing that when it comes to looking for special moments, we're not necessarily looking for fanfare and parades and trumpets and comets blazing across the sky, but it must be, it may be the most mundane, boring moment of your week in which God has something special planned. Our, our motive for doing this is our belief that every moment is potentially a God moment, a time when God might do something amazing in our lives, or God might use us to do something amazing in someone else's life. Even in those most mundane moments, we live in expectation that God may be ready to move. Evelyn Underhill, a writer, wrote, um, our whole life is to be poised on a certain glad expectancy of God. Taking each moment, incident, choice, and opportunity as material placed in our hand by the Creator, whose whole intricate and mysterious process moves toward the triumph of love and who has given each living spirit a tiny part in this vast work of transformation. I love her statement there, um, a certain glad expectancy of God. That certain glad expectancy is what motivates us to live as if every moment may be the moment that God's going to do something to or through us. So if our, if our mission is to take advantage of those special moments, and if our motive is the belief that every moment is a God moment, then our mindset, this is no surprise to you, must be one of prayer. This is where waiting begins to become active and not passive. If we're going to wait expectantly and patiently for God, we must do so in a state of prayer. Uh, Eugene Peterson, the pastor and professor, uh, he did the paraphrase called The Message, if you're familiar with that. He unfortunately passed away a month or two ago. But he wrote, waiting in prayer is a disciplined refusal to act before God acts. That sums up everything we've been talking about. Waiting in prayer is a disciplined refusal to act before God acts. Waiting and recognizing and acting upon those special moments as mundane as they might be. So if you want to live within God's timing, then pray and pray, and when you think you've prayed enough, pray some more. Seek God's guidance. Ask for the wisdom to see God at work in those mundane, those uh, seemingly unspecial moments in your life. Ask him to show you and tell you what he wants you to do, and live with that certain glad expectancy that any moment may be the moment that God moves. And then as we wait in prayer, this is the tough part. <laughs> we have to maintain an attitude of patience. And again, we've already admitted we don't like to be patient. But when I'm not patient with God, what am I saying to God? I'm saying, God, I know better than you do. When I'm not patient and I want things to go my way and I think things should speed up or go faster, I'm telling God, God, I got a better grip on this than you do. I have a better understanding of the big picture than you do. And that is simply incorrect. We must be patient prayerfully and expectantly. We have to be patient because the Christian life is not the Christian life if we try to maintain control. 
And when we're impatient, that is us trying to take away control from God. Our lives are only distinctly Christian when we allow God to be in charge. And when we work at his pace, at his place, in his way, and in his time. And the prophet Isaiah, you'll be familiar with this, many of you, shares a promise for those who wait for God. Those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. When we are patient, when we wait for God with great expectation, we will fly with the eagles, he says. We will soar in our faith, in our worship of God, in our ability to be obedient to God and serve him. And if we don't wait, we're stuck on the ground with the turkeys. While they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. From our view of things, not the best time. From Mary's view of things, probably not the best time. But according to God's plan, it was the time. God works in our lives on his time. God blesses us or asks us to show extreme obedience on his schedule, not on our schedule. God asked a young Jewish girl to birth him into his own creation. And she said yes. And then the waiting began. She may have preferred to have her baby earlier while at home. She may have preferred to have her baby after the census was over so there wasn't so much hustle and bustle. But God's place and God's way and God's time was in an animal cave behind an inn in Bethlehem while Mary and Joseph and others were there at the command of an oppressive government. Mary gave her life completely over to God's timing and trusted him for the outcome. She didn't get to set the calendar or the schedule. He did. We don't get to set the calendar or the schedule. Our responsibility is to wait. And as we wait for Christ, that's a particularly a theme in Advent. Uh, we, uh, as we've already said, we're waiting for the incarnation. We're waiting for the return of Christ. But waiting for God is something that goes on all year long. And as we wait for Christ, we join with other believers. We join with creation itself. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8. Uh, this is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us. But the longer we wait, the larger we become, and the more joyful our expectancy. Wait expectantly and prayerfully and patiently for God. Wait, secure in the knowledge that every moment of your life is a moment full of God potential. Wait for the God who entered his creation in the most unlikeliest of ways and times and places. Wait for God to do a great thing in your life or to ask a great thing from you with the expectancy of a pregnant mother. Wait for the God who will work in your life on his time. Amen. Christ whose glory fills the skies, Christ the everlasting light, the sun of righteousness arise, and a triumph for the shades of night. And come thou long-awaited one In the fullness of your love And loose this heart bound up by shame And I will never be the same So here I wait in hope of you soul's longing through and through and a day spring come on high be near and day star in my
my heart appear and dark and cheerless is the morn until your love in me is born and joyless is the evening song until Emmanuel has come so here I wait in hope of you souls longing through and through and a day spring from on high be near and day star in my heart appear so here I wait in hope of you all my souls longing through and through and day spring from on high be near and day star in my heart appear